that God blesses the message. Amen. Amen. Uh, some of you follow me on Facebook. Um, if you haven't, maybe you'd like to. Um, those who do seem to get something out of it. <laughs> I did put up a post this week about today's sermon. Some of you may have seen it. Um, the sermon today is one that lots of preachers might avoid these days, but it's in the Bible. And this church is founded on the Word of God, and so it needs to be preached. Years ago, a message like today would be commonplace, as indeed the chapels in those days were full and Many, many people were serving God in all kinds of capacities. Sadly, they're missing today. The other thing that I would just like to mention is when this church was founded in 1643, the people were so hungry to hear God's word that they would walk from Norwich to Yarmouth and back something like 46 miles, to hear William Bridge preach. Did William Bridge preach a five-minute sermon? No. He may have preached two or three hours. And we have stories in the Bible of people falling out of windows that the sermons were long. So it, it, the sermon today is a little longer than I would choose but it's not two or three hours. So I am praying that God will bless you. The subject is forgiveness and continuing the series on the Lord's Prayer. And it's mentioned twice. First, Matthew 6 and verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, and then Luke puts it in 11, verse 4, Forgive us our sins, as we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Our series of talks on the Lord's Prayer bring us today to just think about a few simple words upon two great fundamental facts of the gospel, man's need for forgiveness and God's willingness to grant it. The petition immediately preceding this one, which we looked at last week, is the prayer for daily bread. We absolutely depend upon God for our very existence, don't we? So our Lord teaches us to ask God for food, the material bread that is to sustain our physical life from day to day. But man shall not live by bread alone. There is another hunger than the hunger of the body. There is a hunger of the soul. And what the soul hungers for is pardon, forgiveness, and the peace which forgiveness always brings. As a pastor, I can tell you, this is a big issue. Many feel, feel guilty. Many people are longing 
to know that their sins are forgiven. Well, today you'll hear all that. So when we have prayed for bread, we've not come to an end. We have another prayer to offer. We have a large request to make. We have a greater blessing to ask. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. The question has often been asked, is life worth living? By some question is answered without reservation uh, 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 um, into the affirmative, but by others in the negative. For myself, I'm not prepared to answer either yes or no. My reply would be, it all depends. Say, I'm a cop-out guy, aren't I? <laughs> Life, it seems to me, is not worth having if it's not lived in the sunshine of God's smile. Life is not worth having if God's face is turned away from us. Life is not worth having if our sins interfere in our lives like a black, frowning cloud between us and the eternal light. To make life worth living, life must be made happy and blessed and peaceful. And before life can be made happy, that barrier of sin must be removed. And we must walk in the light of God's countenance. The prayer for bread is a prayer for life, for mere existence. But mere existence may be a doubtful blessing. To some, the extension of life simply means the perpetuation of misery. Why should men pray for the continuance of a life which is radically miserable? There are multitudes, aren't there, in our world more inclined to pray for swift death than for long life. They say with the late Charles Kingsley, the sooner it's over, the sooner to sleep. No, it's not mere life. This is not life at any price, but it is the blessed and peaceful life we want. So we go on to pray for a greater gift than far than the gift of bread. We go on to pray for that which alone can make life tolerable and really worth living. We're going to pray for mercy, for pardon, for reconciliation and peace. Hear the words. Father, forgive us our sins. There's that word that many churches have forgotten. S-I-N. It's an ugly word. A word that stands for the ugliest, most terrible fact in God's universe. The world was fair and bright until sin entered into it. All its wretchedness is the result of sin. Man was pure and happy until sin entered. His foulness and broken-heartedness are the result of sin. The Bible looks at this terrible fact of sin and fails to find a single word large enough to describe it in all its many aspects of horror. It employs various words for this one terrible thing according as it views it from different standpoints. Looking at it from the standpoint of the true end of human life, sin is a missing of the mark. The chief end of man. Here we are, non-conformists. Non you know the Westminster Catechism. What is it? The chief end of man is... Love. 
to worship God. It's to glorify God. And so the sinner fails in that. He misses the mark. Sin from this point of view means failure, defeat, disaster. The Bible looks at sin from the standpoint of law, the divine law, written in the nature and on the conscience of man, and brands sin as lawlessness. Every single sin is a trespass, transgression, and overstepping of the bounds. The Bible looks at sin from the standpoint of prudence and stigmatizes sin as folly. The most stupendous and senseless of all follies. The sinner is a man or woman who for a few moments of delirious excitement barters away their immortal soul. The Bible looks at sin from the standpoint of God and sin then becomes disobedience or, as in the text quoted from Matthew, it becomes a debt. Perhaps we are too apt to think of sin only in its effect upon our lives. We think of the blight it brings upon human character and the ruin it makes in human lives. It is terrible to us because it always brings a curse with it. We fear and dread sin, not always because of its own intrinsic horror, but because of the penalties it inevitably entails. So that all too often, a very fear of sin has its root in selfishness and springs out of self-love. I want to say to you that we shall never see sin in its naked horror. We shall never see it in its awful hatefulness until we look at it from another standpoint. We sin not against ourselves alone, but against God. David, in a great crime of his life, had sinned against Uriah, whose blood he had caused to be shed, and against Bathsheba, the partner of his sin, and against his own soul. But when under the faithful address of the prophet Nathan, he was brought to see that awful sin of his in its true light. He lost sight of himself and Bathsheba and Uriah. He could only think of the God he had flouted and outraged and grieved. And this was the agonized cry that broke from his lips against thee only I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. Then comes the enormity of sin. It is sin against God. Let me illustrate what I mean from our ordinary human life. Say that a son who's been loved at home and has been the pride of his mother's heart falls into disgrace and is brought before the police courts charged with some shameful deed. If such a son has any feeling at all, his sin will appear hateful to him. Not so much because it's brought disgrace and loss of liberty to himself, but because a way at his home, a mother's heart is well nigh broken with shame and grief. That will be the keenest stab of pain such a lad will suffer. 
It's the picture of his heartbroken mother that will make him loathe and despise and hate his sin. It is then we shall see the hatefulness of sin when we occupy David's standpoint and say, against thee only I have sinned. Even though sin entailed no loss to the sinner, involved no penalty, brought with it no curse, it would remain still utterly lonesome and hateful if we only realised that every sin of ours caused grief and pain to the heart of the eternal God, our loving Father in heaven. All of us had parents, haven't we? Do you remember the grief and pain that you caused them with your wrongdoing? That's multiplied with the Lord because he has a sensitive heart. Now that is the point of view from which is regarded in this prayer. It's against God. Matthew uses the word debt as Dr. Morrison, the famous theologian, says, when we sin, there is something in our act for which we become liable to God. Formerly, he had a claim upon us. Now he has a claim against us. The sins of our past are included in this word debt. They have not done with us, though we have tried to persuade ourselves that we've done with them. Ah, what a relief it would be if we could only be sure that sin, when once committed, was over and done with forever. But it's not so. These sins of ours register themselves in a great book of accounts. Not one is admitted. Not one is overlooked. Not one is forgotten. Do we try to persuade ourselves that somehow or other the sins of the past have been lost sight of? Do we try to flatter ourselves that we have been buried and lost sight of? That is a vain hope. There are no mistakes, no admissions in the eternal count books. The ink of those books never fades. Every sin is entered. There you see them. Long, black, a damning list. That's your debt and mine. Sins of commission. The evil words we have spoken. The evil deeds we have done. They're all there. Then there are the sins of omission. They're there as well. In fact, I fancy it is to the sins of this class that the word debt specially points. Debt is something we owe. In relation to God, it's something we owed to him and failed to pay. So it stands here for the many things we ought to have done and which we have left undone. Do you know that prayer? I've done those things I ought not to have done. <laughs> Do you remember that one? There are some of us who perhaps flatter ourselves that we have never committed any fragrant sin. We're not blasphemers. We're not drunkards. We're not perfect squanderers. We've never committed theft or adultery or even murder. We've never been guilty of any crime. This has brought us, this has brought us public shame. And then on, on the strength of that, we are half inclined to think that the name sinner is not applicable to us. But notice how that word debt lays hold of us, of even the most respectable of us. There are certain things we owe to God 
We owe him reverence. Have we given him that? We owe him obedience. Have we given him that? We owe him service. Have we given it to him? We owe him our heart's best love. Have we given that love to him? We owe him the first place in our thoughts and affections. Have we given it to him? We owe him complete and utter surrender. Have we given it to him? Ask ourselves these questions. Probe our hearts with them. Face them frankly and honestly. Have you given God perfect obedience, the best love of your heart, and first place in your life? Oh, how such questions humble us. How they cover us with shame and confusion. Looking back over my own life, I can see how many years have been marred and disfigured by my failure to give God what he has right to expect. I can see that I have not reverenced him as I ought, that I have not obeyed him as I ought, that I have not placed him first as I ought. When I begin to ask myself if I've done what God expects from me, my pride all disappears. My heart is pierced as with sharp swords. My self-satisfaction is torn to shreds and I'm humble to the dust. For as I look back, every day tells its tale of things left undone, which I ought to have done, and these sins of omission rise up before me, a mountain load of debt, which I owe to God. Debt. It's in the news every day, isn't it? Thousands have financial debt. But what of the debt to God? What a terrible word that is to every true and honest man or woman. There are multitudes who would, refer, would, would prefer to bear privation and poverty rather than run into debt. Being on the dole is bad enough, but better the dole than debt. But will you allow me to say that all of us are debtors? We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have come short. We have given God less than his due. He has a claim against us. We are in debt to him. And the debt is one that cannot be expressed in the figures and coinage of the earth. It is a debt that money can never pay. I've heard sometimes of men who when I've uh, when I found themselves, when they found themselves in financial difficulties, have called cool, cool their creditors, called their creditors together, and said to them, "If you will, but give me time, I'll pay you all in full." And from time to time, we read in our newspapers of honourable men discharging with interest debts they've occurred long before. Can we do something like that with this debt that we owe to God? Can we work it off in days and years that are to come? I cannot hold out to you any hope of doing that. Work as hard as you like to please God today. When the day is done, what will you have to say? Just this. We have been unprofitable servants 
We have only done what we ought. Only what we ought. There is no margin, nothing over which you can apply to the reduction of the old debt. There are arrears of obligation and they're untouched. May I venture to say that before a night comes, by some sin or other, you will have added to that debt. It would be easier to bail the ocean dry as to hope by your own efforts to pay this debt. It would be as easy, no, it would be infinitely easier to count the sands of the seashore than remove this mountain load of obligation. Try your best. You will fail as Paul failed, as Luther failed. <coughs> In spite of your best efforts, the debt, that crushing debt, goes on increasing. Well, or can you, what can you do? You can do nothing. Sin past and present, sin of commission of, and omission, sin that long, black, damning record that stands against your name and mine in the eternal count book. What can we do with it? How can we remove it? <coughs> How can you blot it out? How can you bury it out of sight and mind? How can you erase it out of the book of that fatal story? You say you must have something done or that debt will strangle you. <coughs> what can you do to be delivered from this body of death? My brother, my sister, you can do nothing. You cannot pay the debt. You cannot blot out the sin. You cannot erase the record from the book. Do your best, and at the end, you'll be in debt. But you say, John, can nothing be done? Am I then doomed to ruin and to death? <coughs> Is there no way of paying this debt? Here is the gospel in a nutshell. Here is the good news, which is as old as the centuries, but as new in your ears and mine today. Something can be done. You can do nothing but God, the God against whom you have sinned. He can do everything. <coughs> he can remove that mountain load of debt. He can blot out that fatal record in the book. He can erase every entry. He can bury your sins out of sight forever. We could never pay that overwhelming debt. But he, he can give us our account back with a word Settled, written at the bottom of his. Oh yes, here is the gospel. Sin in man, but forgiveness in God. Death in man, but mercy in God. We read these wonderful words in Romans 5 and verse 20. You might like to underline it. Romans 5, 20. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. How about that? Listen to what God will do with your sins and mine. He will cancel the debt. He will blot out the handwriting that was against us and put it out of the way, nailing it to the cross of Christ. He will erase that fight, that 
fatal record in the book. He'll remember our sins against us no more. As far as the east is from the west, so far will he remove our transgressions from us. Listen to his invitation and his gracious promise, which we find in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Listen carefully. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Do you know that verse? Mm -hmm. Isaiah 1 and verse 18. This is the gospel. This is the good news. There is something greater, stronger than the sin of man. And that is the grace of God. I can see a limit to human sin. I can see no limit to the divine mercy. I love this headline from a hymn. And I expect you know it. You might start singing it. Plenteous grace with thee is found. Grace to pardon all my sin. Those those words sound familiar? One of the hymn verses. Yes, there is mercy with God. There is forgiveness with him. The wonder of the world still is that the God against whom we have sinned is the one who will take away our sin. That remedy of the cross of Christ, it is he, the sinless Jesus, who's cancelled the debt. He died for us according to the scriptures. It is his pierced hand that shall blot out the record of our sin. It is in his lifeblood that we are to be washed free from every stain. It's at the foot of the cross our sins are buried. Christ, the sinless one, is a lamb of God. He's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the gospel. There is a debt against us we could never hope to pay. But God, for Christ's sake, will cancel it. There are sins which crush us with their weight and burden. But God, for Christ's sake, will take them all away. There are stains upon us, black and deep and foul. But the, at the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son cleanses us from all sin. Just say, the snow descends from heaven and hides all the grime and filth of the earth underneath its mantle until the whole surface is one pure, glistening white. So God will let his mercy cover us. He will clothe us in righteousness until every stain is covered and we stand whiter than snow. <coughs> I remember singing that chorus at the Keswick Convention. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Does anybody remember that one? Wonderful. We read in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19 these wonderful words that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And I want to preach the free, glad gospel of the cross to you today. I want to say to you, sin-stricken, perishing, dying men and women, there is forgiveness in God. There is nothing which mercy 
cannot do. There is no sin too great, no guilt too black for him to pardon. A poor criminal in Scotland, as he went to the place of execution some years ago, kept crying out, he's a great forgiver, he's a great forgiver. Let us men and women, ruined and undone by sin, praise God, for he is a great forgiver. His tender mercy is always available. In God's mercy is our hope. And the cross is the pledge of pardon, which stoops to the lowest and most vile. The cross, the cross, the bitter, shameful cross, the glorious, radiant cross, our most jubilant songs arise from the cross. Well, what was the price of pardon? I can tell you what it cost God. It cost God the death of his own dear son. The cross was necessary to make pardon possible. Without shedding of blood, there's no remission. That is what your forgiveness and mine cost God. It cost him the blood of his son. But what will it cost us? What would it cost? It will cost us nothing. As I said when speaking of the previous petition, God does not sell. God gives. Some have tried to buy forgiveness by fasts and vigils and penances and rigid self-discipline. That is how Luther, when he was a monk at Erfruck, and Thomas Binney, when he was a student at Cambridge, tried to obtain pardon and peace. Some even believe that pardon was to be bought with money. So the boxes of the indulgent sellers in Germany, filled with the coins of men and women who wanted forgiveness. But pardon is not to be bought, neither with money, nor with penances, nor vigils, nor fasts. Forgiveness is to be had for nothing. Pardon is given without money and without price. All that is required is that you ask for it. Ask and you shall receive. Zacchaeus asked and he received it. Mary of Magdala asked and she received it. The thief on the cross asked and he received it. Come and ask and you too shall receive it. Why will you be troubled any more? Why will you die, O house of Israel? Come and ask, and you shall hear the answer fall on your ears like the sweetest music. Son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. That is what this petition teaches us to do. It bids us come and ask. For Jesus recognizes that all of us are debtors, but the debt will be remitted for the asking. Therefore, he teaches us to pray, forgive us our trespasses. The ground of forgiveness is not in ourselves. It's not because of our own merit that the debt is cancelled. We are saved not by works, but by grace. We are forgiven because of the boundless love that fills the heart of God. The love that found expression in the cross of Christ. Our confidence lies in the fact that God is our Father. Let us trust the Father 
This is believed. That the message of the cross. Let us hang back through doubt. Let us not hang back through doubt or fear. Let us go with boldness to the throne of grace, just as we are, guilty, sin-stained and vile. And he will cast none of us out, but he will give us freely. His anger will be turned away, and he will comfort us. And peace like a river shall flood our troubled souls. Let me now ask you to notice for a moment the qualifying clause. As we also have forgiven our debtors, says Matthew, for we ourselves also forgive everyone that is indebted to us, says Luke. I think these words are meant to be in the first place words of encouragement. If a man can forgive, how much more can God? They remind us of that splendid verse found in Luke 11 and verse 13. Here it is. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We have known men who have generously and freely forgiven great wrongs committed against them. We are told to think of the way in which even men can forgive in order that we may have faith to believe that God, who is infinitely more loving and pitiful than the best of men, can and will forgive to the uttermost. But these words are also words of solemn warning. Sometimes they make the prayer die on our lips, for they require the forgiving spirit to be in us before we ask forgiveness from God. Do you notice how the prayer, which soars to the heights, enforces also the simple everyday moralities? Look at this petition. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. For we ourselves also forgive everyone. Is that true? Have you forgiven everyone? Are there no grudges that you cherish? Are there no animosities in your heart? Is there no one against whom you cherish malice or ill will? If there is ill will against anyone in your heart, can you pray this prayer? Can you say to God, forgive us our sins <coughs> as we also forgive everyone? You remember how in a striking story of the two debtors, our Lord condemned the man who could ask God to forgive him that awful debt of sin and yet harbour an unforgiving spirit against his neighbour. Oh, what a warning, a solemn warning. There is in this petition, found in Matthew 6 and verse 15, but if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Or look at the way Matthew puts it. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. In closing, I want to ask you a plain question. Would you really like God to forgive you just in exactly the same way as you forgive your enemies? Do you think you would? Why is it not our forgiveness all too grudging and half-hearted? 
Do we not often appreciate the remembrance of the offences? Do you not say, I will forgive, but I cannot forget? Have those words been on your tongue? I've heard them many times. Would you like God to forgive you like that? I could not forget the words of the late Augustus Hare, who lived from 1834 to 1903. He was quite a famous English writer who also restored Homehurst St. Mary, a very famous building near Hastings. He wrote on this passage, he pictured an unforgiving man praying this prayer. And this is what he says. O oh God, I have sinned against you many times from my youth up till now. I've often been forgetful of your goodness. I've neglected your service. I've broken your laws. I've done many things utterly wrong against you, such as my guilt. O oh Lord, in your sight, deal with me, I beseech you, even as I deal with my neighbour. He has not offended me one-tenth, one-hundredth part as much as I have offended you. But I cannot forgive him. Deal with me, I beseech you, O oh Lord, as I deal with him. He's been very ungrateful to me, though not a tenth, not a hundredth part, as ungrateful as I have been to you. Yet I cannot overlook his ingratitude. Deal with me, O Lord, I beseech you, as I deal with him. I'll remember and treasure up every trifle which shows how ill he's behaved to me. Deal with me, I beseech you, O Lord, as I deal with him. I'm determined to take the very first opportunity of doing him an ill turn. Deal with me, I beseech thee, O Lord, as I deal with him. Oh, what a terrible curse such a prayer is. But friends, may it not be that. If we cherish unkind feelings in our hearts, if we hug secret hates and hatreds, when we ask God to forgive us in exactly the same way as we forgive others, we too may be invoking not blessing, but doom upon our own heads. Before we can pray this prayer, we need the spirit of forgiveness in our own hearts. Emerson said of Abraham Lincoln that his heart was as big as the world and there was no room in it for the memory of a wrong. Such must be our spirit also that Jesus showed when on the cross he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. May God help us, even now, to forgive from our hearts our brothers their trespasses. Then we can draw near with boldness to the throne of grace and say, Father, forgive us our sins, as we ourselves also forgive everyone who has sinned against us. Amen. And we finish with a wonderful hymn. Fill your lungs. Let's sing it out. It's 735. We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. During the hymn, the collection will be taken. <coughs>
Yes, Lord. 